Hello and welcome again. Um, I'm talking today with Ola Oduku. Um, Ola, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Ola Oduku and I'm now head of school at the University of Liverpool's School of Architecture. Uh, I'm a professor in architecture and I guess my specialism is uh, modernism in sub-Saharan Africa, particularly West Africa, but I'm also interested in diasporas and communities, particularly in urban areas in the global north and the global south. Uh, that's a beautifully, uh, uh, beautifully uh, precise and concise uh, description of what you do. I think your, your expertise is, is hugely important to us, certainly to my students at the moment. Um, uh, I'm sort of, uh, I have a lot of students who are interested in, in the, di the African diaspora. Um, and issues around identity are increasingly important, I think, in architecture. Um, my first encounter with you, I think, was my gut feeling is that I met you as an undergraduate when I was an undergraduate at Manchester, but I'm not sure if that's true. That might have been via Liverpool, because I did have an early stint in Liverpool. Uh, it was my first actual lecturing job after graduating from Cambridge. So it's possible that that's where you may well have met me. Yeah. Um, and then, and otherwise, then, I migrated north. <laughs> yeah, up, up to Edinburgh. Um, uh, my, my interest, I suppose, to just to foreground it, my interest in, in the, uh, the issues around modernism in Africa came via a book by a woman called Jennifer Robinson, who wrote an excellent short book called Ordinary Cities, about the experience of modernity in Africa by people who sort of within the discourse around modernism, particularly in urban studies and, and architecture, aren't seen as being modernized. And I thought it was, a, it's, a, it's a beautifully written book. And then I've re read two of your books, which we're going to touch on today, Learning Spaces in Africa, Critical Histories of the 21st Century of 21st to 21st century challenges and change by Routledge and Africa beyond the post-colonial political and social cultural identities, which you edited with Alfred Zach Williams, who's in the States, is he? No, he's actually in Liverpool, amazingly. Oh. He's an emeritus professor of sociology now. He's actually off um, Sierra Leonean extraction, but has right. done a lot of work in in West Africa, mainly mm -hmm. Sierra Leone and Nigeria, but he's a professor of sociology. I yeah. see. Or he I was see. a professor of sociology. Well, they're both beautifully written books and they're really, really interesting. And I, I was, you know, really pleased to be able to have a pick through them. And I picked out some themes that I thought we could talk about. And I asked my wife and I asked my children, if you were asking someone about modern architecture in West Africa, what would you want to know? And my daughter said, the first question, and it, you know, out of the mouths of babes, um, what was traditional domestic life or home life like? Because this is kind of what we frame all this discussion in relation to, isn't it? To a large extent, yes. Um, I think that's that is a perspicacious quest, um, question from your daughter. Um, which probably makes sense because normally people think about Africa and they go straight to the idea about the safari and whatever mm -hmm. architecture is in relation to that. Um, but no, I think the issue is, uh, I guess from an intellectual perspective, the issue would be more around nowadays anyway, I often start with the literature. There's a lot of literature on Africa Mm -hmm. And we've had, or we've, yeah, we've had a number of Nobel Prize winners now, but the work of the late great Chinua Achebe and how he talks about Africa, the African village, and how people lived in a kind of traditional cultural sense, and how modernity hits um, the traditional, the everyday in Africa. So his main book, which I always I guess is kind of the foundational discussion about, I would say community and African, and in other words, how Africans live from an African perspective would be his book, Things Fall Apart, mm -hmm. where, I mean, it's, it's, it is, I mean, it is from the Yates saying, things fall apart, turning and turning in the winding guard, things mm. fall apart um, and nothing's ever the same again. Mm. But he basically talks about a small village and their encounter with, um, the, the white man, both as a missionary, first of all, and then the whole colonial encounter. So the, 
the view of the village is from both the eyes of the people in the village, but then from the eyes of the colonial officers and also the missionaries coming in. So that encounter with what had been over time and a new being, which I guess one could call colonialism, which then becomes modernity. So that's the way I would always frame it. Um, but our understanding about what is modern in Africa is, I guess, much more nebulous um, from the yeah. perspective. But it, I guess in terms of everyday living, though, I think there is very much kind of, it, it, it does come from anthropology, which I know we're going to go into. But the idea about the community in Africa being somewhat more, well, the, the word is, autarctic, I think it is, um, uh, more like self-governing small groups of people in villages versus the big cities until you get to the parts of what was Islamic architecture. So from about the 17th century onwards, from the fringes of the Sahara to the north of the Sahara, you have very strong Islamic influence. So, you know, large, well, walled cities or town cities like Kano, Sokoto, uh, a number of cities that are part of what was the furthest reaches of the Hausa Islamic um, empire. Mm -hmm. So that is very different from the coastal communities where, who were much more autonomous. They did their thing. They had their own self-organization, organizing settlements, which again, obviously the heinous effects of the slave trade begin to have an effect on, but part of the reasons that have been said that historically the slave trade was so successful is because a lot of these small communities could not organize themselves against, you know, basically the incoming Portuguese, um, Dutch, British, whoever. So there's that idea about, I guess, almost a romantic vision, slightly rose tinted glasses about these um, small um, coastal and uh, forest communities of small groups of people who um, had their own uh, living systems, their own governance systems. So if we then go more granularly to the architecture itself, then we can talk about what the buildings were in these villages. So we're into the vernacular and traditional architecture, which of course has this encounter with the modern or the colonial when the, when the co colony comes in to take over what had been a much more, whatever the African pre-colonial settlement was. And was the pre-colonial settlement based around uh tribal or ethnic or and these these are difficult words because the, these words are understood within our own discourse within our uh a western shall we say white framing of those yeah. words so when i say tribal i yeah. appreciate that what i understand as tribe might not be relevant here but or, or was it based around family groupings is it more like a uh, in in this in the particularly in the West African context, is it more like that? I think so. I mean, the closer again, you borrowing directly from sociology, anthropology, kinship networks. So, and that's actually not that different, to be honest, from Europe, probably post medieval Europe. Yeah. So you know, there would be somebody who would not be a chief. The word chief, actually, particularly in southern Nigeria, for example. So I'm dual nationality. I'm also Nigerian and British. Uh, the idea about the chief actually came in with the colonials who right. wanted you know, people to, to talk to who would sub-govern. But in most places you would have the elders and mm -hmm. you'd have families. And again, because there were these disparate groups and communities, the idea would be that you enhanced your family by effectively yeah, marrying well, but marrying into, com into kinships near and around you. You rarely ever went more than probably 40 miles away from your village to get married. Mm. So you are sort of increasing these kinship networks through marriage, um, trade, and some other things as well. But um, more, I would say kinship than necessarily tribe, although it is true that linguistically, um, although Africa has, I think, well, someone like Nigeria has apparently five, more than 500 registered languages, but there are some large, um, language groups yeah. who, again, from actually more from the missions, to be honest, when they started um, in, um, transcribing the Bible, they have what, for example, they have what they call the Igbo National Union Bible, which is all the kind of ethnic, or I guess it would be the same as dialects of Igbo, are kind of smoothened into this dialect that 
is now used to transcribe the Igbo Bible, which people, uh, the missionaries in the 1860s or maybe even earlier, were were um, involved in putting together. So, but to show you how different it is, if you think about East Africa, Swahili starts from really the southern reaches of um, Botswana, or northern reaches of Botswana, right up to Tanzania, Somalia. Whereas in the case of the Igbo Bible, you're talking of a very, very small area, probably mm. not more than 200 meters uh, diameter, right through to just show you how many languages there are and the need to actually, if you like, uh, in terms of, um, again, modernizing the ways mm. in which one communicates, these languages become smoothened out into union Igbo. That's what it was called. Yeah. It's amazing. That's amazingly interesting. I, I, I want to come back to this idea of modernization, this, th this thing you pick out about medieval Europe. So you've got this idea of modernization. Hannah Arendt talks about this. Marx talks about this. Everybody who's theorized about the emergence of modernity has the theorized about the character of pre-Reformation, essentially, pre-Reformation um, Europe, which is based around, I suppose, non non-economically productive or less economically productive forms of kinship networks, as you call it. Um, and, and, you know, in Marx's analysis of, of the emergence of capitalism, you get this idea that modernity or modernization acts like a steamroller, squishes people into urban centers, breaks down a kind of what he calls a feudal system, but it's a kind of networked and and is that is that essentially the same process that is then applied to the to to, to the African context, or is it, or is there something distinctly, uh, is there some distinct character to the the kind of colonial imperial uh, onslaught on Africa? Well, I think you could read it into it, and the fact that effectively again you have warring groups of Europeans who are wanting a piece of the action as well. Yeah. So it's not just. So if we take the United Kingdom, you could say that, you know, the beginning of the industrial com complex, you know, the um, industrialization and the, um, you know, what's it, uh, iron mills and so on, mm -hmm. you know, that modernity comes and we now start looking at a less feudal system of peasant mm -hmm. led farming. I think in the case of Africa, unfortunately, one does have to mention the effects of the slave trade. Although, I mean, the historians say it, it should be noted that there was already trade and trade networks before the slave trade. So these ideas about trading um, activities and how the encounter with the other was something that was already there, but was, if you like, accommodated and moderated over time is something that did affect Africa. Did it change their production values? Probably not as much as obviously the effects of an event like the slave trade and mm -hmm. indeed the coming of the missions. So. Let's take North Africa, for example. So with, as I said, the Islamic empire comes large trade routes to places like Timbuktu mm -hmm. and so on. And they are trading with people from the Northern parts of West Africa. So that idea about trade mm -hmm. is not, you know, predates the, the slave trade. Mm -hmm. You also have evidence now of indeed the Chinese, for example, on the East coast of Africa, the Swahili coast. So they've had direct contact with Oman, parts of India and parts of China. There are shards of apparently Chinese pottery that have now been found around Mombasa and so on. So this history, in fact, I did write a paper a while ago where I said that in some ways Africa was modern before the word modern was actually understood in the mm -hmm. sense that these encounters with others had happened for a lot of time, really probably from about the Reformation. Because mm. you also have, I mean, although they're still, I, I hear they're now being slightly disputed. People like Marco Polo and so on, they're going to China, but they're also going south, mm. you know, towards, um, well, what was then, I guess, the Maghreb. And the outer reaches of the Maghreb, again, go across to Africa. Mm. So there, the idea of the other mm. is not unknown. And the idea that one trades you know, with both one's kinship networks and further afield is also part of the, the, um, the, the, the oral history of a lot of African kinship groups or tribes, if you want to call them it there. But what then pushes them to a much more, I guess, modernized state where people have to, um, you know, are producing to a modernist technique or whatever comes in much later. So yes, that 
if you like, modernism in the eyes of the European in Africa probably does begin with the, uh, the colonial and missionary encounter and indeed the slavery encounter. So this idea of other, of the other, I think is, is, is something worth picking up. And I think it comes to my second point in a way, which is this idea of the emergence, as you call it uh, in your book, the emergence of anthropology with its focus on primitive, inverted commas, other culture. And so this idea which we get with colonization, and I think you point to this in a number of the things that you've written and, and in the book with, um, with Zach Williams, is this idea that yeah. mo modernity is predicated on an idea of othering and making primitive that which it is that which it is not. So it, I mean, it does it to the pre pre Reformation period in Britain, and you can see this. So, from for a historian of 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 my, of my background, you can see this in the way that, for example, discussions around pre Reformation civic social religious life are framed as barbaric. We even call it the Dark Ages as if that's an acceptable thing to call anything. And you look at, you, you know, you look at some of the cultural and material outputs of, of the Dark Ages and they're extraordinarily brilliant. You look at Saxon jewelry, it's, you know, craftsmanship of a standard that we could only dream of really. Anyway, and you look at the cathedrals and so on and so forth. So there's this othering that goes on. And then this seems to be something that we in architecture in the modern period actually embrace and use it as a way of kind of I don't know what it's for. Le Corbusier is the preeminent example with his, um, with his, uh, with his uh, vernacularisms. Uh, but yeah. it goes before that, doesn't it? To Gottfried Semper, and it goes. Um, exactly. yeah. And you've got people like Brancusi. There are lots of people who, for lack of a better word, appropriate the exotic. Mm. Uh, so you're into the kind of Orientalism almost. There are these other cultures that are really exotic, exoticized, and. Um, can only contribute in a different way to what is, well, the Western canon mm. would be the way I would say so. But I think obviously, again, this is where the ominous effect of slavery, I mean, a lot of the writing around there suggests that there was the need to other because you have to actually justify why people become chattel. Mm. You see what I mean? So yeah, it yeah. becomes even more important to, to separate. And the, particularly with the missionaries, indeed, I guess the similarity would be somewhere like Ireland. It was very important to say you need to come to religion in order to take away the primitive nature of the past. Mm. Uh, and that in itself, I mean, even my, my late father, I mean, he was, uh, he went to one of the you know, best schools at the time, which is actually a, a government college. So it was run by the colonials, not the missionaries. But he would all, you know, he would always say, you know, African culture is seen as primitive. Mm. So, you know, it was very much, you know, so we're talking right up to whatever early part of the 20th century, probably right up until the 60s. Mm. The idea that, you know, whatever was before the missions was really primitive and you really need to get rid of that mm. to come into the modern world, right up to your buildings, your dress, yeah. your everything. So, so this idea of, of the colonial experience in Africa and the, this idea of this pre-existing uh, urban and architectural form based around kinship networks, I kind of am interested to think about what that might look like spatially, formally, aesthetically. And then, and, and are we to understand this process of urbanization that's occurred in Africa at an incredible speed in, in places like Lagos and, and, and southern West Africa. Is that a process of modernization? Is the kind of the new urban center a process of modernization? And do we see in those spaces a new form of modernity as a consequence that is inherently African, a kind of African inflection of a modernizing of modernism? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the issue is, is modernization the word to use? It is in a way because to a large extent, although having said so, I mean, I'm thinking as I'm talking now, I mean, I would say indeed cities like Lagos, actually before Lagos was Badagri, which is a major slaving. Um, it was called point. Badagri. Yeah, in fact, Lagos is the equivalent to, ooh, I don't know, what would be the example? It would be like talking about Greenwich in relation to ooh, somewhere much further north in London. So Lagos, the history of Lagos is such that the, the major king of 
that area was a major slave trader. So the British decided to depose him. And what's, what easier way than to create another kind of administrative capital down the road oh. and put your brother in charge? So Badagri was actually the main um, space, I guess, what would I call it, urban enclave um, or populated enclave and on that part of coastal Africa. And you have it happening all the time. So for example, in Accra, in Ghana, the main um, capital was in Elmina, which is mm. further down. So oftentimes they would take away from where the original or where most of the original trading went on to create another smaller town or city that has the administrative focus and whom uh, the, um, those who are involved in governing are seated and therefore the, 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 new, the new town, so to speak, can be planned. Mm. But what's happened over time generally with these other cities is that they become part of a bigger metropolis. Mm. So in the case of Accra and Elmina, you've got Tema. It's becoming this very, I would say, a much longer, well, a, uh, a linear situation where you've got the original center and the new center. The only, um, I guess, it's, it's only in places like Mombasa versus Nairobi, you see a great difference. So Mombasa is coastal, Nairobi is up country somewhere. Mm -hmm. And again, that's a purely European construction. It was, it was, I think it was not even a village. It was literally new land that then becomes this major city uh, administrative capital. Mm. But my point being that there had been some forms of larger settlements, even in the kinship networks, because mm. there was already trades taking place. Um, but what happens with, um, if you like, this encounter with colonialism and modernity is that these centers either become absorbed and therefore have a kind of more European element that becomes part of what already had been a collection of people or the collection of people who were downstream from wherever the, the new center is become, well, I would say it's an, almost an accretion. So they, be, they become part of this planned city. But mm. that accretion is something that I think is an encounter with modernity, which is unique. So the idea about it just being slums and so on, I think is shorthand for something much more creative. Mm. But it's, it's called that because it doesn't fit into the pattern of obviously the colonial plan. So we're back to maybe the Roman plans in the, in the UK. Mm. Just that if you like the Roman era passes and then it's then we have some archaeology, then we have the next. In mm. this case, as you're right, I think your point is well made because of the rapidity of the growth, they kind of merge together. There's never this kind of point where it all stops and then we start again. Mm. It just gets added to. I'd say it's much more accretion over time. Mm. And then what we have is what's called chaotic modernism or whatever. Whereas I would say that there's something before the modernity oftentimes and there's something that then becomes created which doesn't fit in with mm. the way in which indeed the western framing or indeed let's let's be even more you know united nations viewing sometimes of what um uh you know a uh, good urban settlement is so i mean in the past i've done a course on african cities and i pointed out that you know i think it's supposed to be 2.1 you, I mean, a bedroom shouldn't have more than two people. Fine, that's okay in Europe. But in a lot of Africa, for most of the time, we're outside yeah. anyway. So if you've got four kids in a bedroom, that's not overcrowding because for a lot of the time, they're not there. Yeah. If it's northern Nigeria, for example, which I know, which has a much more Sahel, you know, dry, arid climate, you're actually sleeping on the roof. Mm. So the fact that a, a house might have two rooms and therefore it might be considered a slum in, you know, thinking about it in whatever UN or whatever mm. terms is very much framed around what the European situation would be, as opposed to how people live their lives. Yes. So even and when we transpose that to new buildings and so on, it still looks as though this is really chaotic and so on, but there's, if you like, there's a method in the madness. Yes. I, I, that really interesting coming back to this idea of the kinship network. My, my guess, so this is just a purely speculative guess. I did my did my doctoral research in, in uh, rural um, Gujarat. Um, and what I saw in the, they were semi-nomadic communities there. And the families, and, and I stayed with one in an informal settlement and it was me, I got the bed because I was the guest. And my uh, friend Prash, he was on the floor and then the family was all around. We were all in one room and it was, it was actually very, um, well, it made me feel less vulnerable. I can tell you that for free. Um, 
but but what happened what seemed to happen in these in these genuinely indigenous the vernacular communities of very ancient standing is that the as the sons and daughters married community compounds so family compounds built within the settlement would expand and so perhaps what we see in the in the kind of what we see as chaotic emergence of cities like lagos is really a kind of organic process of community growth which is which is not replicable as you say by you know top down diktats from the un or whoever it is well that's right i mean in some ways it works well when they do work with anthropologists to be honest so there's a part of ghana accra jamestown which from the name you can imagine had had an early encounter with, well, there's a, a, James, a, fort, it's a fort, there's a fort near there. I think it is the British fort. And, you know, there have been settlements that have been built up over time, mm. but they actually do have a sanitation network there, which was put in by, I think it's British engineers at the end of early 20th century. And I know my colleague actually, Ian Jackson, he went down with a group who had water sanitation engineers and they actually tested the water uh, that came through pipes. So it's a very historic Victorian pipe system in place. Yeah. And the water was actually incredibly um, clear. The quality was very good because they kept those drainage networks and, yeah. and worked with local communities. So actually you'd have better drainage in what would be considered a fairly chaotic semi-slum settlement than in some of these posher neighborhoods where everybody's got a borehole and yeah. nobody's sampling the water. Yeah. So if it's done properly and in relationship to what the indigenous community networks are, you sometimes have some really interesting um, what would I call it, um, solutions to things where where you think it was chaotic, it's actually not bad. The health systems hold up. They stand up very well. So this idea of the, the second administrative centre operating as a sort of tensioning point to the original uh, uh, administrative centre or, or urban centre of the indigenous community, I know that the I know that the French Imperial project had some or I'm under the impression that the French Imperial project had a certain kind of um, uh, specifically peculiar agenda of creating a second class of people who were mixed race. I, I did my master's thesis project in Senegal in Dakar in Senegal and um, you know did research around that and, and and you know that was quite but I don't think the I don't know but my it, am I right in assuming that what the British idea, so that you see in, say, for example, Nigeria, is that they create a, a spatial visual counterpoint which serves to produce the same effect? That is to say, produce a class of people who can encounter it and engage with it, and those that so can't. Yes, yeah. so, I mean, it's, a, it's very interesting. I mean, one thing. I think, again, this like cultural amnesia about is the whole idea about the whole apartheid settlement. It does actually come from um, segregation, which, again, goes back to Ireland beyond the Can you repeat that? The, so the, the, the what? The what the, settlement? Uh, the apartheid, the segregated oh. settlement. Oh, yeah. So this idea about various places where different people live mm -hmm. um, actually comes to a large extent from the British encounter. So mm. before the Dutch actually, if you like, specialise it and turn it into the, the horrors that were apartheid, mm. I think the British encounter was very much around, yes, creating separate spaces for different groups. Mm. So in fact, what we have actually both in India and I hear in a lot of Africa and the rest of the post colonies are first class, second class and third class cities. So mm. that's to do with the ways in which administration takes place but in these cities you would still have these spaces for different groups so there's often the government reserved area which is essentially white but as you have more educated quote-unquote natives they can also encounter that space then you have the native town where the natives are and then there's the, there's the unregulated I guess what we've now called the slum areas around it. Mm. So the, the rules of engagement, so to speak, the spatial design is very much around making sure that the areas where the um, colonial administration lived, worked and played was properly laid out, had the, the roads, had the um, uh, what, you know the houses, the bungalow houses, and whatever it is, half a hectare of land. That all happened in that part. Whereas mm -hmm. by the time you get to the native city, the um, the 
what would I call it? The land rights are, are less, you've got less land, and but there's still a specific way in which you have to build your house. So this is back to the ideas about making sure the sanitation and everything works. Mm. And then you had everything else. Now it becomes interestingly different depending on where it is. So in parts of northern Nigeria, because you've already got an Islamic state, uh, Islamic setup, there's what's called the walled city. And often those who are true indigents live within the walls. And apparently that there was always that negotiation as to where the colonial administrator would live in relation to the city. And this is where you find actually sometimes even the schools, that's in my book, they actually begin to be built much more, they're built much more like traditional Hausa buildings with the mud, thick mud walls and everything. So there's an appreciation of a culture that has a kind of segregational level because if you were an outsider in Islamic cities, you lived outside the walls. And if you're an insider, you live inside the walls. So you've got these spatial segregated spaces already that exist. And I would say the British way of making sure that continued was to lay out the cities that way. Mm. The other reading, particularly about, about West Africa, is the triumph of the mosquito. There was never the issue about there being too many Europeans in a lot of West Africa because they died. Yeah. So there was the need to have a much more, all, you know, at least a, 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 a black, a native elite who would be part mm. of this larger, um, what I call it, colonial administration area. Mm. But the majority of the natives would be in the, in fact, they talk, call it the native town. Um, or the yeah the native area which is part of so the the components of the of the town. I see. So that, and and that and that sort of that sort of foregrounds the the apartheid approach to se segregation. I think that's really really. Well, and then you also have the, you you normally have either the golf course, the polo ground. There's always that cordon sanitaire mm. which the French adopt. So there's that space between them, but. But, and then, you know, the justification is interesting because before the uh, understanding about the Anopheles mosquitoes relationship to malaria, the idea was that the miasma, you need to be away from the natives who mm. carry these diseases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Miasma <laughs> theory. It's really peculiar. Yeah. I, I've been reading about miasma theory really recently. We have we have a little bit got back to miasma theory uh, these well, days. Well, this is it. You know, I mean, some of us laugh because some of the regulations published of Victorian times have probably saved some of the cities, certainly in West Africa. I mean, you couldn't design a bathroom in West Africa without having a window. You need to have that ventilation through. Yeah. So the idea about, you know, totally sealed, well, like a shopping center and so on in most of Africa is totally foreign. Mm. Right up until we come to the 90s when we're having these, we want to be like Dubai or whatever it is. But generally the basic design always suggested you need to have ventilation. Basically the things we're being told now. Yes. <laughs> the world the wheel has turned so so we have this so we have this moment of colonialism we could talk about that for for for, for ages and it's an incredibly um a difficult topic but a very interesting um uh, and a, uh, exciting i suppose in a way and we then have this moment of post-colonialism where we get also some of the characters that have played a role in establishing, you know, people like Le Corbusier with his with his um, uh, his proposals for Addis Ababa in the 1930s, yeah. Yeah. which is a kind of erasure of program, and and Corbusier's uh, legacy is rightly being a little bit questioned these days, um, and and people like Fry and Drew who go and you've written about them uh, who go into West African context and produce something that is synthetic hybrid i mean i'd, lo I'd love to I'd, so so this relates to this idea of post-colonialism and i and I, I wondered whether you could perhaps talk about that and 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 perhaps how some of these modernists straddled this moment yeah i mean i think i'm quite sympathetic in the sense that I think there was that moment, again, post-World War II, when in India and in Africa, people, the, I guess, emerging elite are saying, we want to be free. There's a, there's a whole, there's a narrative around being different and independent. Mm -hmm. And with that, looking back, there are the colonial structures of which architecture is one of the major things. So mm. I have talked about the idea about, you know, either you have the church or you have the clock tower in a lot of um, schools. So there's always this organizing structure, which is effectively 
a throwback to the idea about, you know, either the church saved you or indeed colonial government is at its best with its clock tower telling us what the time is. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that idea about, you know, these buildings of the colonial administration are things that remind us of a past that we want to move on from is incredibly seductive. But I think, again, ingrained in almost 100 years or more of people's memories, the fact that there's the, still the primitive. So I think I have quoted it, and I, I really still have to go back to the archive, but there's an encounter apparently between James Cubitt, the architect, and Namdi Azikiwe, who was the first premier of um, Nigeria, the Eastern region. And he sets up the University of Nigeria Musuka, which is a bit like Ibadan, but in Eastern Nigeria. Mm. And he suggests, oh, we can have some really interesting mud brick buildings because it will be much more environmentally um, responsive and everything. And Azikiwe says to him, we're not going back to the primitive ages. Our buildings have to be in concrete. Mm. So there's that idea about the past still being something to uh, break away from. Mm. And even if the colonial is bad, there needs to be something that is not primitive, quote unquote, and is different from the colonial. So in some ways that modernist moment that, that um, a lot of Africans, I would say India as well, encounters post-World War II is something that a lot of the elites want to embrace because we want to be like everybody else. You could say that fast forward to the 90s, the MTV generation, everybody wants to be able to live the MT MTV life. So you've got that happening, I would say, in the 1940s, plus the fact that there's a the bit of the techno science that I just alluded to, where you know these buildings are justified because they do the things, you know, what you see is what you get. There's good ventilation, the Blue Soleil works, and so on and so forth. Although nowadays we know that some of that may well have come from the Mashbriya in, um, in um, Islamic culture, the idea about the screen and so on and so forth. But there's a justification for what is considered modern. Mm. And that's the lifestyle and that's the architecture that the elite in these new nations aspire towards. Mm. And you've got the architects like Fry and Drew who really transmogrify from being part of the colonial regime to being the architects who sort of say, and we can give it to you. <laughs> so, you know, it's, just, it's seductive, isn't it? You know? <laughs> so, so um, I'm, I'm sympathetic because I guess also because I went to University of Nigeria in Tuga, for example, and uh, my school was probably one of my secondary school was a UNESCO. It, it actually comes from the UNESCO school designs program in the 1960s, and it was you know it was a comfortable school to be in. So some of it, in terms of the way the buildings performed, worked. The question would be, you know, indeed, as you say, what was the identity? What what therefore becomes a modern, the more skillful architects, like I would say Cubit, Fry and Drew, the ACP group, then synthesize, they appropriate bits of the African into it, whether it's, you know, using um, block work that follows the, um, what are they called again, the Adinkra symbols in, in Ghana. So Premper College, for example, you've got this um, screen wall that, you know, the little block blocks actually are, relate back to um, Ghanaian, um, models and ideas, mm. or um, African co partnerships, Bristol Hotel in Lagos, where they get well, interestingly, this really Susan Benga is a Swiss Jewish emigrant, emigre, who then becomes an Orisha priest in Western Nigeria. But she creates these amazing murals. So there's a whole mural that she is commissioned to put on the side of this hotel. You know, so you've got this real syncretism in a way. Yeah. But you could say it's still mediated from a Western perspective, you know. So so there are these interesting experiments that yeah. happen, um, but they don't really... I think the issue is at that moment, what would have been great is if that, that then becomes absorbed, appropriated and changed by a local African elite, but they stand as being almost kind of experimental pieces. Yeah. And... I guess the person in the quote unquote slum doesn't really engage that much with it. So then so now we've no. got these fetishized objects. Yeah. Almost. But then you have this other thing which you've alluded to uh in, in both uh the these books that 
um, I, I read of yours, which is the which is the experience of the diaspora itself feeding back right. into it. And you see that perhaps really clearly in the work of someone like, well, you see it most clearly in your previous reference, which is MTV Cribs, which is the idea that there so so whilst the, the you know the slum dwelling informal settlement dwelling african might not encounter modernist architecture and its joys and glories they do encounter the world of media and they do see what the african experience in america in the uk wherever it is uh, in in south korea i lived in south korea a while and the, there's a large nigerian community in the center of of seoul um there so you, so there's this diasporic experience which feeds back probably my guess is at a more grassroots level than I think it's beginning to trickle back yeah. yeah um which is interesting i think we're at a very interesting point in time i mean i would certainly i mean obviously the big ones that we've all heard of are um Kere's work yeah in um Burkina Faso and um obviously uh what's his name again the floating school yeah um uh his name eludes me at this point so, but anyway you. his I... work and to a large to a lesser extent david ajay so there are big players but again they're on the international stage but as you say at the kind of local informal settlement level yes everybody has a cheap mobile phone now it yeah. might not be an apple but they have a cheap mobile phone. And that gives them that link to a reality. And in Nigeria, the idea about Nollywood, very close to Bollywood, you know, you can live your dream looking at your Nollywood clip. And I think that's slowly beginning to have, um, or beginning to have, what's the word? Is beginning to um, make incremental steps into how people see their lives and how they live. But again, I think it's the issue that the built environment is just, it's always slightly behind the curve. So the literature we've got already, there's some really, well, Chimamanda Adichie or whatever, you know, there's always nowadays in terms of new authors, there's always some authors from Africa, whether it's Adichie, whether it's, um, well, Ngudi Wasiolo and Kua, the earlier generation. But I mean, I'd be thinking about people like, uh, there's a Kenyan authoress and so on. Anyway. There's a lot of literature out there. There's a lot in the area of textiles. Uh, music I've commented on, you know, you now have people who are chart hitting both in Africa and, and in America and in the UK. Mm. So there's that. But the, the translation of culture in terms of the built environment has been much slower. And I would say it's not just the fact that buildings last for longer. I think it's the issue about that failure to engage with the building materials, which is, I would say, only beginning to happen now. So Southeast Asia is where I normally go to in the sense of the bamboo architecture that's coming through yeah. in places like Vietnam, Bali, and so on. Um, but for a lot of Africa, there's a much more, there's a closer adherence to the building standards that we've had, to be honest, since the um, Victorian times. It's mm. taken a long time to move from let's use something more experimental or you know let's look at materials that are more local so it's it's that um it's that interstice that we're beginning to discuss but in some ways yes you'd say an informal settlement particularly in places like um south africa i think there's been more creative use um i mean in the past i have called it what do you call it slum slum chic mm. shack architecture but I think there's been a bit more creativity. Um, I'm beginning to see a bit of it now. Even in Lagos, there, there's a new blog whose name I do not have, but hopefully when you edit this, I'll look for it, where they, they've now started to look at um, a retrospective of buildings in over the past year. So I've looked at their last three years. And recently, there's been one about the rehabilitation of a Victorian built house in a kind of near coastal community in Lagos and how they've got the wooden materials together they've redone them mm. but there's been an influence of um you know some kind of African carving which you know about well certainly when I was doing architecture Nigeria was just not the thing yeah so there's a there's the beginning of an appreciation of if you like a historic past which can sort of begin to influence how architectures interpreted or reinterpreted yeah. and then there was also this container 
as a container cafe, which wasn't just containers, it really did have some kind of what I call it, there was a kind of nod towards, well, indeed, the kind of informality in the way in which it was all put together. Now, what I don't know is who these architects are. I suspect it's a much more multinational, or at least multinationally trained architecture set of architects, which is probably right, because you, as you say, the diaspora comes back. Mm. So it's that influence of uh, I, probably the generation below me who are sort of saying, right, we've got our degrees from Europe or wherever, and we want to sort of see what we can do in an emerging um, diasporic Africa. Mm. I mean, the, the balance to that, though, is this Acon city, which I commented on, which is, you know, kind of some kind of um, sort of bad image of um, it's a it's a combination of Dubai and Wakanda. So mm. you know, the fact that you could actually do that <laughs> is frightening. Um, you know what that actually means, particularly because you know it said, oh well, there'd be lots of employment. What as maids and so on. You know, yeah. where does the local employment come into recreating a Dubai in you know one of the slightly poorest co uh, countries in Africa? It doesn't make mm. sense. Yeah, uh, and we have the spectre in Lagos of um, Echo Island, which will be the largest island stroke gated community apparently in Africa. Is it going to be like Macau, basically? Oh dear. I mean, basically, it's an island. Yeah. <laughs> there um, you go. But it's it's um this 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 thing this modernization process. Uh, sorry, this um. It, I don't know if you've got a phrase for it, this vernacularization of modernity, which has its parallels in, so Fry and Drew try it out and they're relatively successful and it foreshadows or foregrounds the critical regionalism moment, potentially in Western and European architecture. And then you get, and then you get it coming back. And, and what I wonder with people like Fry and Drew is whether there's an attempt to kind of stick on Africanness as a kind of wallpaper. And you see this in, I don't mean to criticize David Ajay, but now he's the richest architect in the world. I feel like he's fair game now. Oh, has he reached that? That's good. Yeah, he's, re he's reached the status of the high, highest, yeah. highest paid architect in the world. Um, anyway, and you look at the Smithsonian Museum he did recently, which has a very kind of, it's a big shed with some cult cultural that, references yeah. to it. <laughs> Uh, but I, but I do wonder whether there could, there, there is in these, in these works that you're talking about, a sense of embodying, pro, not pre-colonial, but African-centric social processes and modes of dwelling and and living, so that the, you know, it's not just a replication of the unité yeah. de habitation. Yeah, or... yeah, yeah. Well, that's why I'd say I'd look at. Um, I, I do. I've got a lot of time for Kerry. Mm. I think he really does look at context in a very interesting way. And he is somebody who, again, if we look at class and architecture, I think really is the one to look at. Kerry is to the best of my knowledge, although true enough, I haven't fact checked. His father lived in a village, said, you, my son, I want you to go out, go out, um, get your education and come and help us develop. And he comes back and his first thing is that school mm. in, and I think that's really interesting because, I mean, my argument with the kind of, as I call them, the aid fraternity is we're still raising money for schools in Burkina Faso, whereas one of the best school architects is a Burkina Faso. So why are we still, you know, you think mm. that you work with said person. But the point is, his background is much more, I think, if you like, in the soil, for lack of a better word. Mm than a lot of diaspora architects who are already, they're coming in with some middle-class values. Mm. And the way in which he actually articulates his space is very, very interesting, mm. I would say. And you can see that continuing in most of the things he does. Yeah. And even if he's doing a frivolous thing, so to speak, like whatever it is, a coachella or whatever it was, you can see that, I would say there's something there that tells me that it's innate. Um, whereas I have to say, I struggle with some of the others. Mm. Um, I mean, I do like the floating school, but I do think it's a provocation and I do mm. like his use of materials. But in terms of there being something to do with uh, an identity, I'm still looking for that in a lot of what's coming mm. out of uh, emerging architecture. Whereas when you listen to music, you look at textiles and the other creative arts, it's very clearly there. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
And, you know, I don't know. May, I mean, some people have pointed out again that Damas Walker, yeah. who you may have heard of, I mean, yes. he basically checked himself out of ABU's area. He decided he wasn't going to go through architectural training. And some would argue that his work, again, is much more um, infused in the artists and creation, artistry and cre creativity of um, West Africa than mm. the classically trained architects. So you might take it the other way and say, maybe we're all being, <laughs> we're being models by effectively a Western architectural education and training. Yeah, uh, a, so, a, a Western architectural education and training, which has its roots in a very hierarchical idea of what constitutes ar acceptable right. architectural precedent and knowledge, which is a problem that isn't limited in my opinion to the African experience, but is a problem, generally speaking, and why architecture remains in, in this country, as, uh, in, in the UK, an elite practice, because it still doesn't permit um, these things. Uh, yeah, Demis Noku, uh, uh, so the, you put one of my students in, uh, you informed her about him, and so it was my first encounter with him. And I thought it was extraordinary because he was using concrete. He's, the, you know, if, if Francis Carey's work is, has that beautiful um, timber light, yeah. um, but with rammed earth walls here and there. Yeah. Lemus Roku's like, it, it, it's like, it's, it's got volume. It's got uh, monolithic qualities. It's got some of these really modernist architectural qualities, but at the same time, spatially and organizationally, so, I mean, he's working with the materials he has. And, you know, this is somebody who's in his late 80s now. So he mm -hmm. is very much, I mean, he would have been a young person around the time Fry and mm -hmm. Drew were around. But, yeah. you know, you wonder whether his actually delinking from what would have been standard architectural practice doesn't have something to do with his encounter, mm. which is very different. But he was and has always been the odd one out. The Royal, mm. the Nigerian Institute of Architects, which is the equivalent of the RIBA, really don't, encounter with him because he's not an architect hello <laughs> so we've got this thing which again let's face it assemble and so on you know i think there's some architects who still turn their nose up at some of that stuff so if you like the train is coming but it's coming slowly <laughs> mm. I, um, I don't want to i don't want to take in too much more of your time but i i do want to ask one thing and it's i didn't raise it in my questions beforehand but you raised it in the introduction which is this idea of appropriation and authenticity, well, appropriation specifically, which is, a, <clears throat> I don't know if you've written about it and I don't know if you want to say anything about it, but my students are, I had one student um, wrote, wrote his master's dissertation called um, Cultural Appropriation is Okay. He's of Nigerian uh, origin, London boy from Nigerian origin, very, 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 very good dissertation. And he was looking at the idea of Gothic architecture being appropriative of certain Islamic forms and structural um, uh, logics. Uh, this idea, again, to go back to something you earlier said, which is about flows and trade. So if Islamic architecture influences Western architecture, likelihood it is there's influences the other way. But pre-modern society is described as being insular, small, backward, so on and so forth. So we can't possibly accept that there might have been knowledge flows. And so I, I wonder about this idea of cultural appropriation being an less problematic than perhaps we might think, insofar as it, what it represents is a sharing of the best ideas that we have. Yeah, I think when it's done well, why not? I think the problem we have with architecture is in a way, yeah, I guess it's the way we view architecture you know what is wholesome and what is harmonious versus mm. what's pastiche and what's added because again let's go back to things like textiles music somehow they've been able to absorb these different influences but mm -hmm. what is it about architecture is it because there's so much fixity in the way in which we deal with it or is it the fact that lifestyles have changed so much that you can either be one or the other i think that ability to be fluid and create something that does what we what will be considered interesting even though it's got various appropriated things in it so well that would be the pomo movement mm. for example 
which let's face it didn't get the best of receptions even in the west mm. so if we talk about i don't know postmodern movement in africa i think there's something about how that really reads and um, yeah because i have environmental design training as well my point is are we comfortable in these spaces and to me that would be my first call so find i mean if you want to have columns i mean in Nigeria, one of the apparently signifiers of um, wealth at the moment is to have these Corinthian columns at the front of your house, or if, you, if it's a bank. So we're literally, so you've got these literally polystyrene type columns, and then the bank behind it with the, with the um, well, still the glass, the kind of um, Miami glass facade. You know, I mean, my issue would be less with the columns, but more with the fact that how much is it costing to air condition behind that Miami glass facade? Yeah. Um, so, but, but there again, yeah, I mean, in a way it is, it creates its own character, and, you know, why not? I mean, we don't all have to live in what would probably be Caribbean style beach houses in a lot of the tropics, which would be yeah. much more culturally appropriate, for example. Yeah. So I think it's more the case of, I guess, how one justifies what one does compositionally and otherwise, because, mm. I mean, let's go to avant-garde art, um, you know, the edges of jazz and so on. You know, who's ever said that Miles Davis didn't appropriate when he wanted to and so on. But there's something about how I think it indeed the flows. So if the diaspora comes back and begins to work with, I guess, the, the everyday and less with the, the seriously rich who can afford anything, what might that produce? I think that will be the test of the, of the pudding. Because at the moment, the issue is that it's still high art to a large extent, architecture. And there's that, well, I've talked about it too. I think there's almost that, I go back to the Turner moment when you've got kind of design and site and services versus architecture. So the architects go one way and then we do site and services for everybody who can't really afford the architecture. What we really want is a reuniting of that schism or schism where we begin to look at what or how we can actually, again, re reinvent or re well, use the appropriations needed to really infuse informal settlements so they're not just these basic site and services sites and mm. they actually begin to function in a way in which people are much more involved in them i guess again maybe this is where we go to, we look at south africa where the, the planned horrid nature of the townships have pretty much gone away and you're getting bits of whatever you want to call it, urban formation in some of the townships, uh, which is different again. So it's not replicating, for example, the posh bits of um, Rondebosch in Cape Town. There are bits of Kailicha that you begin to see bits of planning. I think the issue there is that who's doing the planning? So you've got the benign um, West, <laughs> Western architects, or architects from indeed the, the benign townships who are doing their do good stuff and how much is actually being done in collaboration with the locals. So this is the co-production co and co-creation of which we hear so much, how much actually takes place and mm. what might that really be? Because what you really want are those for whom the space is being um, planned, calling most of the shots, but that's difficult when the money's coming from elsewhere. It is, yes. And it's also very difficult when the voice of those people, when the people themselves are used to their voice not being heard, they don't even have the languages to articulate what. So the architect in that situation has a very complex role, almost like an anthrop. Well, to go back, almost like an anthropologist, like an ethnographer, of exploring and examining and watching and observing and, and talking. Um, but it's complicated, isn't it? I think it will change uh, because I think with with the larger numbers of diasporas and young diasporas actually thinking about investing in Africa, because I think that is, as they say, this is the last place of investment, apparently. Um, Africa and bits of Southeast Asia that aren't heavily invested. It'll be interesting to see what, what that, indeed, that encounter produces. What a fabulous finishing point. Thank you so very much, Ola. That's been amazingly interesting. Thank you. <laughs>